year was 1519, and Hernando Cortez landed on the shores of Mexico. With them were 600 soldiers to face an entire Aztec warrior nation. There have been two prior expeditions sent by Spain to conquer the land of Mexico, and both had failed miserably, and both had had many more men than Cortez had with him that day. Cortez knew that the road that lay before him was going to be difficult. He knew that it was going to be dangerous. And he also knew that every man standing behind him was going to be tempted to run back to the ship and sail back to Spain if things got going in a bad way. So as soon as all the men and their provisions were off the boats, Cortez commanded that all 11 ships be burned and sunk to the bottom of Veracruz Harbor. So as his armies stood on the shore, facing an Aztec warrior nation in front of them, their only means of retreat burning in the gulf behind them, they knew without any shadow of a doubt that on that day there was no return and no turning back. The only way to go was forward. When we turn our lives over to Christ, that's where we find ourselves in the same situation. A vast ocean of past behind us. No return, no way of going back. And a battlefield. Our past is gone, our future lies ahead, and so what do we do with that? In our lectionary passage for this morning, we're called to think about the cost of being a follower of Jesus Christ, a cost of discipleship. You know, so often we Christians want to talk about all the benefits of being a Christian. How wonderful it is to be a Christian. All the great things that come with being a Christian. But we really don't want to talk about or hear about the cost of being a disciple of Christ. We rarely want to hear about it because it's not easy to live for Christ. The lectionary reading comes this morning from the Gospel of Luke. And it actually calls for it to begin reading in verse 51. But in order to fully understand these verses that the lectionary presents us with, I want to back up just a little bit and look at what our passage says through the lens of what Luke had written earlier, beginning with verse 23. Then Jesus said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. <coughs> now drop down to verse 51. As the time drew near for Jesus to ascend to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. 
he sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? Jesus turned and rebuked them. And so they went on to another village. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. Jesus said to another person, Come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me go home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another one said, Yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. As we saw in our reading today, following Jesus isn't just tagging along. It means picking up our cross and going with him. Now Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is on his way, and he knows, even though his followers don't at the time, even though he's told them three times already, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, be persecuted, and put to death. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows what lies ahead of him. And here he has people coming up to him, or he's asking people to follow him. And they're saying, yeah, I... But, I don't know about you, but I can get pretty darn comfortable in my discipleship. It's very easy to go from day to day just cruising along, thinking, I'm doing my part, I'm a good disciple. But as Jesus taught us, being a disciple means every single day picking up our cross and following Him. In our story today, Luke pointed out three characters that Jesus came in contact with when He was on His way to Jerusalem. And each one of those men thought they wanted to be a disciple. They thought they wanted to be a disciple. They thought they wanted to they said, yes, I'll follow you, but let me do this first. In each short conversation that Jesus had with each man, he exploded what I call their ideas of comfort. He told them very quickly, following me is not comfort. As a matter of fact, not a one of those three men ended up following Jesus that we know of. I think closer examination of these three guys might show us some of the things that we find comfort in also need to be exploded. The first guy, obviously impressed with Jesus comes up to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, maybe he had seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fish and fishes. Maybe he had been there when Jesus cast the legion of demons out of that man, sent him into the pigs, and they ran running off the cliff. Maybe he was in that group coming from Capernaum 
that saw Jesus tell the widow's son, rise up off of your deathbed, walk. Whatever it was, somehow or another, this young man was very impressed with Jesus. He liked what he saw, and he wanted, promised, to go wherever Jesus went and to endure whatever Jesus endured. But Jesus had to remind him to count the cost. Perhaps Jesus was simply trying to find out what his expectations were. In the end, Jesus said to this man that the cost of his discipleship meant giving up the comfort of his security. A true follower of Christ, a disciple, must first find security in God, not in things of this world. How many of us thought we had security in our jobs? We were real secure in our jobs. Everything was going great put a lot of years in. We were secure. We were set. We were going to be there till we retired. How many of us have found the comfort of security in our homes or where we live only to discover that that wind can come through and snap a branch off and bring your roof crashing in like that? A spark from a water heater or a furnace can send it up into ashes in no time. What about those of us who have placed our comfort and security in our savings accounts and our IRAs and our CDs? <laughs> Only to watch them disappear. You see, being a follower of Christ requires complete surrender. Complete surrender. Being a follower of Christ demands that we give ownership of what we think we have over to Christ. Because all the things that we cherish as symbols of our comfort of security, this is it, folks, really belong to God to begin with. He just allows us to be stewards with them for the short time that we walk this earth. To be true disciples, we must be willing to surrender everything that we have, all that we hope for and all that we are to Him. We can't hold anything back. There cannot be any but Jesus if we're going to be a follower. Some of us might find it quite uncomfortable giving up the comfort of our security to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The next man that Jesus ran into and invited to follow him <clears throat> had a different issue of comfort. He said, sure, I'll follow you. He agreed to follow until Jesus asked him to give up the comfort of his priorities. This young man was bound and determined to be a follower with conditions. I need to do this first. Let me go take care of my priorities, Jesus, and then we'll come talk about your priorities. He told Jesus he needed to go home and bury his father. There's two schools of thought on this. Some think his father really was dead. I personally go to the other school that says the father wasn't even dead. He was probably elderly and maybe ready to pass away, but he wasn't dead yet, or the young man wouldn't have been there following Jesus that day. He would have been at home taking care of his family and making funeral preparations and going through the Jewish grieving process. What this potential follower of Jesus was really saying was, let me go home and handle what I think my priorities are, and I'll join you later. I'll catch up with you, Jesus. <laughs> How many of us say that? I'll catch up with you later, Jesus. You go on to Jerusalem. I'm going to do what I think is important, but I'll catch up with you. What 
Jesus told them 